a greatest joy and privilege, really, to have been given this uh, opportunity and this great honor to come and meet with you, friends. Um, I was mentioning last night to some of you who were there that I, when I was a child, I grew up amongst the early believers and they could never conceive, they could never believe in their, um, in their, uh, or use their imagination that one day the believers from all over the world and especially from Europe and America people will embrace this faith because in those days the faith was completely limited to a few countries in the East and uh, when you think of it really one of the greatest uh, proofs of this revelation is that in a small, little, dirty, filthy prison, a dungeon in Tehran, the light of this great revelation broke down, broke upon that terrible dark dungeon and who would have imagined in those days that that light will shine all over the world and reach to these remote places as far as Tehran is concerned the Siachal of Tehran and will illumine the hearts of many many people and bring in a new creation and now you can see the results of this, how the faith has spread, how the power of Baha'u'llah has penetrated into the hearts of peoples all over the world this is something which I really appreciated very much perhaps more than all of you because I remember those days when we were so few and when the faith was limited to just those lands remote far far from here their culture different their background different and now look at what's happened the world has been conquered by Baha'u'llah. He has created a new race of men <laughs> and you are the new race of men really and for me therefore it's the greatest privilege really to be able to look into your faces on behalf of the early believers who would have loved to see one European or American believer in their lives. They would have loved to gaze upon the face of a person who says I believe in Baha'u'llah coming from the Western world. Uh, well, friends, I uh, feel that uh, this weekend we are going to be together, hopefully, to go through some of the most important, uh, in my view, aspects of our faith. It's, it is marvelous to be a Baha'i but we have a great challenge and the challenge is to grow in the faith that our faith may grow day by day this is I think the challenge to every person and if our faith does not grow every day then it's not good it's like a child which is born, it, it, that child must grow. If the child does not grow, then it's not healthy. And uh, this is why Baha'u'llah has mentioned in his writings, he says that we must make our life in such a way that uh, the morning would be better than the previous evening. And tomorrow would be better than today. And we have to feel it. And this is, I think, the challenge to all of us. Perhaps it's easy to be a Baha'i or to become a Baha'i, but it is very difficult to grow as a Baha'i. Look back upon the earlier days, one can feel that one has in the faith.
and nobody can say that I've grown enough nobody we as long as we live here we have the scope uh, to grow now I <laughs> I thought to sh perhaps share with you some of these basic thoughts now do not think for one moment that I have got all this um, know-how that I have achieved all of these things all I'm trying to do is from the writings of Baha'u'llah and the writings and the history of the faith and the history of the believers to just bring to your notice what we can do to grow and I feel that one of the subjects which we should first begin with and it's a subject which is really uh, a very important subject which we often do not think about and I'm not talking of Baha'is but especially of the non-Baha'is of, um, of the outside world they seldom, seldom think or care about this subject and that is about our soul because everything begins with the soul really and I think it is time that we paid some attention to find out what is the soul to look at it to see what condition it is what condition is it now really our souls and in order to start this subject I wanted to mention that um, in order to appreciate uh, spiritual realities uh, we should look at two things if you want to understand the spiritual principle, a spiritual reality, you should look at two things and look at them very carefully one is nature and one is the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and when you put the two together then we can understand many spiritual realities nature uh, can teach us an awful lot because God's creation uh, is one entity God has not created two different worlds uh, the spiritual world separate and, this, and the physical world separate it's not like this he has created one entity the spiritual and the physical world is one and the same and the laws which run through this this creation are the same laws the same laws that run in nature exactly the same laws apply in the spiritual realms the same laws that apply in that, that you will find them in nature the same laws uh, are operative in religion every one of the major teachings of Baha'u'llah has its origin in nature every one of his teachings it is very natural religion is very natural the laws that run within the world of man, within our world are also have their origin in nature we can learn a great deal from nature but each one of these laws are applied on a higher and higher level as you go higher and higher into the spiritual realms you see a certain law you find in nature that law finds its application in the spiritual worlds and uh, but it has added features to it it has got it's to be applied on a higher level but it is the same law and so if you know something physical if you can understand the law of nature uh, you can understand something of its spiritual laws provided you read the writings I mentioned that because if you don't then you can get lost in your um, efforts to rationalize things and to bring in your uh, rational faculties into it and try to compare things you could get lost but if you read the writings and then look at nature then we can understand many spiritual realities now I will give you an example of this just to give you an example of how the laws of God are the same uh, in, the spirit, in the physical world and the spiritual worlds uh, you know I'll give you one example just an example they all the laws which govern the creation the, the, the creation of a tree for example 
are the same laws as those which um, are given, are used in the creation of man. The same principles, the same laws apply to the two things. They are, they are very much counterparts of each other. A tree and a man. You see, the tree must, will drive its roots down into the ground to receive its sustenance, to get its sustenance. It's from the ground because everything depends on the roots going down into the ground. It depends, its food comes from there. But the tree itself, as if it dislikes the ground, the ground is a very dirty uh, place, it's a low, uh, one of the lowest kingdoms, and uh, the tree has no choice but to receive all its sustenance from this dirty soil. But the tree itself doesn't like the soil. It goes in the opposite direction, do you notice? It it's as if it dislikes this earth. It moves in the opposite direction. And when it moves in the opposite directions, what happens? It receives the most beautiful thing of all. It receives the rays of the sun. Can you imagine the difference between the rays of the sun and the dirt of the soil? It receives the rays of the sun and as a result of it, it produces beautiful flowers and beautiful fruits. Just because it detached itself from this earth, disliked this earth. It moves in the other direction. If the tree would have said, well, I owe everything to this earth. My food comes from this earth. I love this earth. I'll go into it myself. Well, then this wouldn't be a tree. It wouldn't be a tree. It would never receive the rays of the sun. Now this is exactly, can you see the exact parallel with the creation of man? We have to live in this world. It's just like this dirty soil of the, for the tree, this earth, this world that we live in. We have to earn a living. We have to live in this world. But, uh, and we have to get our food, our sustenance, our livelihood from this world. But the soul does not like this world, should not like this world. And that it should move, it should dislike it, it should really um, become detached from this earth and focus its attention in the opposite direction. And if we do that, if we become detached from the things of this world, then the rays of the Sun of Truth will shine upon us and then our soul will produce beautiful fruits, you see, just like the tree. But if I attach myself to the things of this world, then there is no such a thing as the rays of the Sun of Truth shining upon me. Now here you see the difference. There's exactly the same principles, but with one difference. I mentioned that the laws which govern, the laws which govern the physical nature and the laws which govern the spiritual world are the same. But they have added features. You see, in the tree, in the example of the tree, you will find the tree has no choice but to grow in the opposite direction. It just grows in the opposite direction. That's the way it's made. But we have an added dimension to this particular law given to us and that is choice, free will. We have the choice of either going down into this earth or, going the opposite, or growing in the opposite direction. It's up to us to choose. If we choose to go into the opposite direction, then you become spiritual. If you go into this, uh, attach yourself to the things of this world, you become attached to material things. But the choice is up to us. Now this, I gave you just an example to share with you how the laws of nature and the laws of higher realms are the same. But they have got different, um, they have to be applied on different levels. Now, we go back to our own story. We wanted to really understand the soul. We were going this morning to really try and discover what is our soul so that we can recognize ourselves, so that we can um, understand our uh, place in life. Again, in order to understand the soul, we must examine another principle. And that principle is what Baha'u'llah mentions. 
He says that in this life, everything in this physical world is a counterpart of something spiritual. Everything you see in this life is not something which is coming to us in a, in a haphazard way. For instance, we were talking of the tree. The tree is not just something isolated that God has created in this physical realm. You can be sure it has parallels, it has counterparts in all the realms of God. This is only a reflection. The tree is only a reflection of something spiritual in the spiritual worlds. So everything has a counterpart. And if you can study um, the counterpart of something, you can understand the other counterpart. If you, other, if you study anything in, in nature, you can, you can study its counterpart in the spiritual realms. Do you see what I mean? For instance, Baha'u'llah mentions uh, that the sun, the sun, is a counterpart of a manifestation of God. What the sun does to this earth, a manifestation of God does to man. So the sun, he says, which is a physical thing, is a counterpart of a manifestation of God. If you want to study the manifestation of God, therefore, to understand something about the manifestation of God, you can study the sun. Really, if you really study the sun, and I mean studying it, you will get a lot of insight into the working of a manifestation of God. Because these two are counterparts. Now, we want to find out what is the counterpart? What is, what is our soul? But you see, the soul is a spiritual entity. It's not a material thing. And if you want to understand our soul, which is a spiritual entity, we have to try, if we could, find a counterpart for it in this physical life. And study that physical thing. If we could find that counterpart and study that uh, physical thing in this life, then we could apply it all its characteristics, the characteristics of its counterpart in the spiritual realm. Do I make myself clear or follow? You see that uh, the soul, as I said, is not a material thing. It's not something you can push it into your body and pull it out of your body. Uh, it's not something you can take it to a laboratory to test it for you. It is, uh, Baha'u'llah says, the soul is an emanation from the worlds of God. An emanation from the spiritual worlds of God. Um, so now, where are we? We want to find a physical counterpart for the soul. There we turn to the writings. There we turn to the writings. And when you turn to the writings, and when you study the writings, it appears to us, that's all I can say, it appears to us. When you read the writings, it appears that the counterpart of the soul, which is a spiritual thing, its counterpart in this physical world, is the embryo growing in the womb of the mother. Whatever happens to the embryo, thank you very much, whatever happens to the embryo growing in the womb of the mother, uh, the same thing applies, happens to the soul. You see, but one is a spiritual thing and one is a physical thing. But now we know everything about the embryo growing in the womb of the mother. And so we can understand from it a lot of parallel points which could apply to the soul. If you could give me a piece of paper, I want to make notes of some of the things I forget. And it comes to my mind and, <laughs> sorry for, thank you very much. Uh, now we'll take the first point. Baha'u'llah mentions that uh, the soul comes into this life, crea it's created by God at the, sign, at the same time of conception. When a child is conceived and the first cell is created in the embryo, physical cell, uh, the soul of man is also created at the same time that the soul of man did not exist before. This is one of the, one of the basic truths which Baha'u'llah has revealed to us. It had, did not have an existence before, but that it was created at the time of conception. In the same way that the cell did not exist before, 
but it came into being at the time of conception. And these entity cannot enter into anything. You cannot say my soul entered my body. You cannot use the word to describe it even. It cannot have any relationship, in fact, with the body. But it is somehow associated with it. And uh, Abdul Baha describes it as, uh, so it's, it says it's similar to the, uh, to the association of light in the mirror. The soul in the body is the same thing, he says. It's the same example he gives is like the light in the mirror. Uh, when you look at the mirror, you cannot put your hand in the mirror and pull the light out. You can't touch it. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not in the mirror. The, reflection, the light is not in the mirror. But it is somewhat associated with it, reflected on it. And if you break the mirror, nothing happens to the light. And Baha'u'llah tells us that it's the same thing with the soul. It's associated with us. It's a spiritual thing. It cannot have any relationship with our body other than just being associated. And even you cannot say associated because you cannot use word to describe it in any way. But whatever it is, we know that, let us say, the nearest we can say, it's associated with us. Now look at, we can find a lot of similarities here between the embryo growing in the womb of the mother and the soul. A lot of similarities. And from this, we can learn a great deal looking again at the writings and looking at nature together. Because as I said, these two things have to go together. Now, one of the similarities is this that the cell is created uh, at the time of conception, the first cell, if you look at it, there is nothing uh, that you can see in the form of limbs or organs or anything. But that cell has the capacity to grow, to multiply, to acquire limbs and organs. So that after a period of say nine months for instance, it will have a perfect, it, you will have a perfect human being from that cell. It has all the capacities to acquire limbs and organs. But when you look at the cell, there's nothing. Nothing uh, really unusual about it. It's just a cell. Now the soul is the same. When the soul comes to us first, at the time of conception, it has no qualities and perfections. It has no virtues, it has no knowledge, it has no wisdom. But it can, it has the capacity during a period of say 70, 80, 100 years that we live in this world to acquire these qualities and perfections. It's just like the cell in the embryo, isn't it? You see now the similarities? You can see how these two things are, em are, are really counterparts of each other. Another uh, similarity is that when the cell uh, is growing in the womb of the mother, it is not um, designed to live there, to stay there all its existence, all the period of its existence, but that it's only there for a very short period. This is not its home. The womb of the mother is not the home for the body of man. It's not his home. It's only a temporary um, place for it to acquire limbs and organs. That's all it is for. Now exactly the same thing applies to the soul. This world which we live in is really a womb world is a womb world for the soul. As if each one of us is pregnant with the soul. Each one of us have the soul in our custody, like shall we say, like preserving it. So that during this period of 100 years, 80 years that we live, or 60 years that we live, uh, our soul may acquire qualities and perfections. But this is not its home. It's a stranger. Really it's a stranger here. In the same way, Sorry, in the same way that the child in the womb of the mother is a stranger there. That's not its place. 
Now, we go further on and uh, we can go and, ex and, and, and find out more similarities. Another similarity is that when they look at the cell growing in the womb of the mother first, um, it is really very insignificant, very insignificant. I mean, a cell is not significant at all, and nobody even notices it. It is so unnoticeable. You have to have a microscope to examine it. So, and, and yet, look at what happens nine months later. You have a person. It has developed into a person. It has um, uh, all the faculties of a man. See the difference between the first day and the last day? The entry into the womb or the creation in the womb and the emerging from the womb. You see that? The difference between the two stages? And it's the same thing with our soul. The day that we are conceived and the soul is created, as I said, it has no identity, it has no personality. It has no individuality really, but it will acquire this. Acquire qualities, perfections, individuality. And Baha'u'llah says that we will retain our individuality and personalities in the next life. So that you are yourself. It's not something that you lose. You are yourself. And he says that the holy souls will associate with all the souls, the holy souls, the prophets, and describe in the next life all their... Uh, sufferings in the path of God and all the joys and all the hardships that they have carried on in this life. So you see, it's not something that you will forget. It's something that you, you have an identity, individuality. And Baha'u'llah mentions, now this is a very beautiful thought, that the soul which comes into being um, will last although it has a beginning and that is when one is conceived but it has no end that it will grow and it will progress as long as God exists in the spiritual worlds of God so you see what a beautiful thing it is to bring children into the world so that you have a child coming into the world a soul which is going to be there till eternity and another feature, which again is part of the teachings of our faith, the soul is indestructible. You cannot destroy it once it is created. It belongs to the spiritual worlds of God. And uh, at, at whatever stage, at whatever stage you um, dissociate it from the body, whether it is at the time that the child even growing in the womb of the mother, if there is a miscarriage, you cannot destroy the soul. The soul is growing, will grow in the spiritual worlds of God. It has not had the chance to acquire qualities and perfections here. Uh, but we are told that God will compensate this. So it's not something which is lost. A child who dies at a young age is the same. He has no chance to develop qualities and perfections, but that it will grow through the bounties of God. And God will compensate for the things that he had not been able to acquire in this life. Now, there are other similarities. We go a little further. And we find that our soul, our, the body, first of all, when we look at the body, we find that, as I mentioned this before, the womb of the mother is not a place for it to live. And the soul also, this is not its place, this home is very much a, a strange place for it, uh, this world. It's like being a bird which is kept in a cage. This is another example that Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha have given in their teachings. That they have, they have given us an example of a bird being kept in a cage. The bird does not belong to the cage. The bird is there in the cage to be fed, to be nourished, so that when the cage breaks, it can take its flight. 
into its own realms. And so again we come to the same conclusion that this period of life that we go through, that our soul is in this womb world, really, and it is here to acquire qualities and perfections. To acquire love, to acquire knowledge, to acquire wisdom, to be loving. Another similarity is that when the child is in the womb of the mother, it acquires limbs and organs there, but those limbs and organs are not really needed in the womb world, cannot use them there. It's not really of, his ben of any benefit to him. Uh, he, has, he uses a little bit of it, for instance, he moves his muscles, he uses, moves a little bit of a movement. You see, but you cannot really, it's not a place for using it. You see, the child, for instance, towards the end, has got perfect eyes, but it cannot see because there is no light. But when it is born, all these limbs and organs which were useless to him, and he could never conceive what it is for, will find some use, and he'll begin to use them. The eyes now become perfect instruments for seeing. You see, the phenomena of seeing is a marvelous phenomena when you look at it. Can you imagine if nobody could ever see, if there was no such a thing as sight? We would be deprived of knowing something about the light. But the light comes, and the combination of the two makes us see. And there we know one of the attributes of God is the all-seeing God. And then we know something of the attributes of God. But you see, these limbs and organs are not useful in the womb world, but it will be useful when it is born here. It's the same thing with us, with the soul. Uh, all the qualities and perfections that the soul acquires in this life, in, the, in this life of 70 or 80 years, I refer to it, I don't know how, what is the length of, what is the duration of life in this country. I don't know how many years people live. Uh, I think people... Uh, may live uh, longer lives huh? than other countries. I know in my, when I was a young person, people used to live to the age of 102, 103, you see, 110. But in here, probably people don't live that long. I'm going to tell you a little story came to my mind. It's not an authentic story. It's one of those pilgrim's notes, and don't ever take note of it. But it is one of those funny things that Shoghi Effendi had a great sense of humor, you know, and uh, <laughs> uh, he used to tell us that uh, he, he told one of the pilgrims about the American way of life. Now, it's no way to um, belittle anything, but he was telling us, he was telling this pilgrims, he said, in a, in a very, in a humorous way, he says that uh, the American male works very hard to please his wife. Now, I don't know if it's true or not. And uh, he works very, very hard and he provides all the facilities and means and comfort for his wife and family. And the poor man comes home tired and exhausted and his wife is full of energy and he wants to take her out to go to theatres, to do these places and enjoy themselves. And so the man, of course, will go and will oblige his wife. And then, as a result of all this hard work, he dies at a younger age. <laughs> and the woman becomes a rich person. <laughs> travels around the world. <laughs> well, these are some of the <coughs> stories. Often Shoghi Effendi made a lot of uh, humorous remarks. You know, Baha'u'llah had also a great sense of humor. You must not think that he did not have a sense of humor. A great sense of humor. Abdul Baha had a sense of humor. Uh, the believers used to have a sense of humor and they used to, those who had the, the capacity to come to Baha'u'llah or to Abdul Baha and make some humorous remarks which would um, make them all laugh, you know. This was one of those characteristics. I tell you now that I said about the Americans, let me go every, uh, tell you everything. Uh, Shoghi Effendi had said to another pilgrim something story. <laughs> I've heard this now, I don't know whether it's true or not. He was trying to describe again the various nations and how each nation has its own characteristics and he said that uh, in America uh, women dominate over men. I hope you don't mind me saying this. Yeah. They rule over their husbands. In Germany, he said, it's the opposite. It's the men who are... He said, in England, it's quite a 
balance. He said it's not a bad thing if a German, ma if a German, uh, if if an American woman married a German man, and they lived in England. <laughs> <laughs> So here we are. <laughs> so, well, we were talking about the soul. I don't know what happened. We went out of it. <laughs> but you know, one of those things that I wanted to uh, mention um, about the soul is that uh, we were saying that the limbs and organs which the child acquires in the womb of the mother are not needed there. But in this life, it's the same thing with the soul, really. These qualities and perfections that we acquire, love, unity, brotherhood, kindness, generosity, knowledge, although we can use it in here in this life somehow to our advantage, they are, not, they are really needed in the next life. They are for the next life that we acquire these qualities and perfections. And even if you don't use these qualities and perfections in this life, you still can live. In fact, this is what happens with most people today. People hate, people kill, and they still can live. They don't use those qualities in this life. And they still can live. But the real place, the real use of all these perfections and qualities that we have to acquire, the real use of them is not here, it's in the next life. All these perfections and qualities and virtues that we must acquire becomes like our spiritual limbs and organs in the next life. It will become active. Just like the eyes which are not active in the womb of the mother and suddenly because the light comes up and it becomes a very marvelous instrument, our acquiring of the quality of love for instance in the next life will become just an instrument through which we can progress and if we don't acquire them in here then we cannot uh, use them in the next life because there is another similarity and that similarity is this that the child must acquire limbs and organs in the womb of the mother if it does not it cannot acquire them in this life if you do not have an eye, or if you do not have an, an arm, you can't acquire them in this life. You are handicapped. You will grow, but you are handicapped. And the same thing we understand is true in the spiritual sense. That the soul uh, must acquire these qualities and perfections in this life. That is why God has brought the body and the soul together. That's why he has decreed that we should live a period of 60, 70, 100 years here to acquire these qualities and perfections. So that these qualities and perfections become instruments of growth for us in the next life. And that if we do not acquire them here, we cannot acquire them in the next life. That's all we understand. And remember, we are not trying to say in, this, uh, in, these, in these talks and in these studies that we can understand the soul now. Let me, first of all, I should have said this in the beginning. Uh, don't think that by hearing these talks on studying the writings, uh, no matter how much deeply you study the soul, you will never understand what the soul is. This is only the impressions we get of the soul. These are impressions. This is as far as man in this life can understand the soul. We are limited in our understanding and vision. We cannot understand everything spiritual. We haven't got the tools for it in this life. It's in the next life that we will see the true reality of our souls. But it is hidden from us. Because there is yet another similarity which I want to mention to you. And that similarity between the two things, between the embryo and the soul, is this. That if ever, if ever, the child the child has not got the capacity to understand what a small place he's living in. What a limited place, a dark place is living in during the period that he is growing in the womb of the mother. He has no capacity to understand that. He has no capacity to understand what a great world expects him to be born into. The vastness, the glory, the greatness of this world 
He cannot see. Impossible for him to see because God has not given him the capacity to understand this. The same God about the greatness of the world which awaits us. The spiritual worlds of God. And in fact, Baha'u'llah mentions that if ever the glory of the next life was revealed to the extent of a needle's eye, then man would commit suicide. In the same way that if a child knew what a small place is living in and what a vast place is awaiting him, that child, you would have, you couldn't live there, you would have a revolution there. Really. <laughs> wouldn't want to live there. But God, the same God, which has not given the child a capacity to appreciate that period, is completely ignorant about it. We are the same in that sense. Because we will never be able to know our soul. In fact, there is a passage in Islam which says, if you want to know God, you should know yourself. They have asked Baha'u'llah, what does this mean? He says it means that when you look at yourself, you will find everything you have in your body is a manifestation of the soul. For instance, your eyesight is a manifestation of the soul in the body. Your hearing is a manifestation of the soul. All your senses are the manifestations of the soul in the body. Your brain is a manifestation of the soul in the body. But he says, your heart, which loves, is a manifestation of the soul in your body. But he says, if you add all these manifestations together, the sum total does not become the soul. And then he says, what is the soul? And then he says, if you live as long as thousands of years, and if all the peoples of the world put their thoughts together, they shall never know what that soul is. And he says, when you reach to that conclusion that you will never understand your soul, the reality of the soul, the essence of your soul, then you will say to yourself, how can I ever know the essence of my God who has created that soul? And you realize your impotence to recognize the essence of God. And he says, when you reach to that stage, the knowledge of God has dawned on you. This is when you begin to know God, when you realize that you will never know him. Impossible to know the essence of God. The essence of God is hidden from the eyes of men. We can never reach it. In fact, Baha'u'llah mentions, he mentions that manifestations of God have no understanding of the essence of God. Because if they did, they would be partners with him. The manifestations of God have no access to the essence of God. You know, you read some of the passages that Shoghi Effendi has translated in English. He says, 10,000 Moses is thunderstruck, I'm paraphrasing his words, at the Sinai of, your revela of God's revelation, not knowing his essence. And 10,000 prophets as great as Jesus are dismayed at this thought of not thou, mine essence thou shalt never know. This is the call they get from God, by my essence thou shalt not know. Baha'u'llah mentions this, 10,000 prophets as great as Jesus stand dismayed at the threshold of God, hearing this voice, thou shalt never know my essence. Now this indicates that the essence of God is beyond the uh, comprehension of anything, can never rise to that. He is the creator and the creator must always stand above his creation. If it was, then we would be equal with him. If the mind could ever grasp anything, it means you are equal with that thing. You can only understand something which is either below you or, above, or, or on, on the same level as you. You can never understand something be above you. It's impossible. So now, Baha'u'llah says this is the meaning. When you realize that you cannot know your own soul, the essence of your soul, then you can say, well, how can I know the essence of my God who has created my soul? Impossible. Now we go a little bit further. Let me take you a little further. Now, I, at what time do we close this session, Mr. Chairman? Twelve. What time is it now? Oh, yes. <laughs> Twelve. But you can't carry on. You mean the first session is going till 12 o'clock? You are very great people. You mean you can listen to all this? <laughs> well, any time you get... There's no break between it, no. 
Yeah, all right. Well, we'll see. If you feel, if I see you yawning, <laughs> and uh, then I'll say, all right, we'll have a break. Actually, if anybody wants to have a little doze off or something or go to a little bit of sleep, go and sit in the back rows because you can never see them. <laughs> That's what they are doing there probably now, in the back rows. <laughs> now I will come back to your questions, if I may. If you just wait till I finish this subject, you might find your, answer, your questions are answered probably. Because we haven't even touched upon the subject. Well now friends, um, We come to another similarity here between the embryo and the soul. And that is that uh, when a child is born, it can bring with him whatever it has. It cannot bring anything that it hasn't. It just brings with him whatever it has. And in fact, one, in one of his tablets, Baha'u'llah says, if you needed anything else in this world, I would have given it to you there, the womb of the mother. Now, it's the same thing with the soul. The soul can take with him whatever it has. But you can't take with you anything which is bad. Because bad does not exist in itself. It has no existence. Now, don't take me wrong and say that I said... one cent or you have one dollar you've just that's very small amount of money this is the meaning of poverty but whatever you have is positive and that's what you can take with you a murderer for instance is a person who has impoverished his soul well he can take with him a little bit of good a saint is a person who has got a lot of good qualities and perfections and he carries with it to the next life and therefore, each one of them is like having a capital. You begin your life with a capital. One is a very small capital, one is a large capital. And everyone grows in the spiritual worlds of God. There is no such thing as eternal damnation. Well, there are some souls which we know are diseased in this life, and this is the only one which God has indicated will not be forgiven. And that is the souls of the covenant breakers. In the, in the, in the Christian theology, it is the, those who sin against the Holy Ghost. And I may, if there is chance, I will explain to you really what is a covenant breaker as we Baha'is uh, talk about it in this, uh, in nature, looking at nature. Not to look at the philosophy of covenant breaking because we have no time for it in the faith, but nature. Again, as I said, you can everything in the faith, you can look at nature and find out these things. Uh, you can find out what covenant breaking is in nature. Now, we don't go into that subject now, but maybe I'll make a note of it here and sometime we can bring it up. So you see, uh, every soul begins its spiritual life depending on its own qualities and perfections that it has acquired in this life. And this is why Baha'u'llah says that in the next life, the souls will be graded. We will be separated. Each one of us, in accordance with his own accomplishments in this life, will attain a certain position, a certain grade, a certain level. And he says those who are on a high level will encompass those who are on a lower level and will completely understand them and will encompass them. And those who are on a lower level will not understand anything about those who are on a higher level. And their life in relation to them, to those who are on a higher level, is like, like non-existence. Now this exactly applies in nature. Exactly. You look at nature. You will find God has created in this nature great many levels of creation. First of all, there are several kingdoms. There is the mineral kingdom, there is the vegetable kingdom, there is the animal kingdom, there is the kingdom of man. And yet within each one of these kingdoms there are grades. 
Look at the animal kingdom. There are so many grades. On one end of the scale, you come across a creature like a worm, for instance. A worm is an animal. And on the other end of the scale, you come across the intelligent animals. And in between, there are enormous number of animals of different degrees, you see. And God seems to love this uh, different levels. He loves to have this difference in his creation. We may not love it. I often say to myself, really, if we were God, we would have... Uh, it's a pity to, for instance, look at creatures like a mouse, for instance. What a terrible thing to be a mouse instead of being a man. Can you imagine he could have been a man? But it's a mouse. Now, God uh, still likes this. He likes the mouse. He likes to have a mouse and he likes to have a man. He likes to have different grades. And it's the same thing in the spiritual worlds of God. We are going to be graded. And the, the life of a worm, in relation to the life of another high intelligent animal, is like death in relation to life. Really. But it has its life. It's not dead. The worm is not dead. It has life. But its life in relation to the life of a dog, for instance, is like, is like death in relation to life. And so it is the same thing we are under we understand in the spiritual realms that men, that the souls will be graded in accordance with what qualities we have acquired. As I told you, we cannot take bad things with us to the next life. But whatever good things we can take, those good things will determine the, the, the level in which we are going to be. Now, another important question, which again we can find it from nature and looking at the writings, of course. As I mentioned before, we must look at these two things always. And from that we learn a lot of things. Is that uh, when you look at the where is the next life? Where is the next world? Now, if you want to know that, look at nature. Nature will answer you. When you look at the child in the womb of the mother, we said that the embryo, remember, growing in the womb of the mother and the soul are counterparts of each other. When you look at the child in the womb of the mother, where is he when he's growing in the womb world? Where is he? He's here. Isn't he? He's in this world, really. The distance is very little. There is only a barrier which prevents him from uh, being in this world. But he's here. He's carried with his mother around. Have you ever seen in a farm an egg breaking and a chicken comes out? Where was the chicken before the egg breaks? <laughs> it was there. But it couldn't realize it itself until the shell breaks. So Baha'u'llah tells us that the next world is here. It's closer to us than we can ever imagine. But it is closed before our eyes. And as I mentioned before, Baha'u'llah says if we could only perceive to the extent of a needle's eye the greatness and the glory of the next life then we would want to commit suicide to get there. So you can see here how the next life, the next world is just beside us. And then there is another thing we learn from the child in the womb of the mother. And that is this, that um, once the child is growing in the womb of the mother, there are many, many um, people who are involved in caring for that child. The mother is the first person who really is um, enabling the child to grow. The father, the mother, the relatives, the doctors, the nurses, the community, all of them are uh, paying attention and working hard for enabling that child to grow once it is in the womb of the mother. And we are told it's the same thing in this life in relation to the holy souls which have passed away. 
They are the cause of all the growth and development which takes place in this life. But you remember I was saying to you, it's a one-way communication. They, are, they encompass us, they help us, they inspire us in ways that we have no way of understanding it. Baha'u'llah mentions that martyrs of the faith will produce such an effect upon the growth and development of this world that although that he says that even though that it takes place rarely it will produce tremendous results in this life. It's just like the, the care, the attention, the love which the parents, the community has for the child growing in the womb of the mother. But as I mentioned to you, we cannot take with us into the next life anything which is bad, because bad does not exist in its, in its own outward sense. So the souls which are gone on in the next life, everything they can do to us is for our good. They have no bad things. They cannot influence us in a bad way. They can only influence us in a good way. And if it is anything which we want, which is bad for us, they can't give it to you. They can only give you what is good for you. And what is good for you sometimes may be sufferings. Maybe it is sufferings. The more our souls suffer, uh, the more it becomes ready to absorb spiritual powers to itself. Suffering in the path of God. Bearing those sacrifices we do Whatever realm it may be, in whatever field, you sacrifice something. You um, give up your time. You're tired, but you give up your time. You go and teach the people. You go and promote the faith. But you go through a great deal of hardship. That is good for the soul. That enables the soul to grow. And those, the concourse on high, those holy souls which are passed away from this life, they will assist us if we, if we walk in the right way. But as soon as you want to go in the wrong way, they cannot assist you. Because they cannot influence us in a bad way. Now I am going to now go into another aspect of the soul. And maybe before I do that, uh, so far, we can, we can go on and on and talk about this quite a lot. But I think uh, we have got an idea here. Maybe it's not a bad thing at this point that if you had any questions <laughs> about what I have said which you have not understood it, maybe we can talk about it now. And then we will go to another aspect of the soul which is very important because all these things that we have said so far about the soul, the soul coming to us from the worlds of God, we said from the spiritual realms, we said that the soul has to acquire qualities and perfections here. We, we, we said how everything in this life has a counterpart uh, in the spiritual world. Anything physical is a counterpart of something spiritual. We discussed all these things and there we get, were able to get some idea, only an idea, an impression of what the soul is and its qualities and powers are. But now and we said that the purpose of life, so far, so far, is to acquire qualities and perfections. But <laughs> there is a greater, greater purpose in our creation. Far, far greater from acquiring qualities and perfections. Far greater. And again, in order to understand that, I'll take you to nature again. But before we enter into this subject, uh, let us see if there is anything so far <laughs> which you want to comment about or question. Now I'm not referring to those people who are sitting in the back who are probably are asleep. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's a place if you want to rest, you know, that's a good place. We have this uh, game in Europe when we have classes. We often say now, look here, go into the back row. It's a good place to be. <laughs> right. Well, it seems to me there is no... Qu yes? Pardon? Uh, when one person dies and then their soul goes on and then it's graded level, 
Yes? Who know? Is that um, the question is this that if you are in a higher grade, will you be able to influence? Is that what you're saying? This world more? Yes. Well, this is what Baha'u'llah says to us. He's, he's, he's not talking of the influence of those. He says the holy souls. In his writings, he talks about the influence of the holy souls in this life is so great that it can uh, produce all the arts and sciences in this life and uh, become the cause of growth. It is obviously from the holy souls that will be, uh, that this will happen. But again, you see, these are only, as I said, our own limited, very, very limited understanding of the realities and the truths. We shall know it in the next life, fully, what's happening. Yes? Sorry? Like the seed is planted, then it grows and acquires qualities and perfections. But at one point, at some point in his life, that soul must produce a child, must give birth to a child. The soul, I'm talking of the soul, which is a spiritual thing, must give birth to a fruit, a child. But as I said, it cannot produce it immediately. And in fact, there is a certain age for it. That it can begin to think in terms of producing a child. And uh, I'll mention the age later on. Now go back to nature again. You will find anything which produces a child is a female, a female species is what produces a child and I, I hope that men would not mind me saying this, I think that females, a female is a much better, more complete form of creation than, than a male. You know that? Oh, you agree? <laughs> oh, there we are. Now men will be angry when I go out of this room. You must be protecting me, you know? I'll be, I'll be attacked. I'll be attacked. <laughs> you see, because a female can reproduce, can produce a fruit. But again, um, the tree cannot produce a, a fruit by itself. And we are just talking of nature. It has to be pollinated. A female cannot produce a child on her own. There must be uh, a relationship with a male factor. So that the female can conceive a child and then give birth to it. This is nature. This is the same thing with the soul. Our soul which is a spiritual entity. If it has to produce a child, it cannot produce a child on her own. The soul here must act as a female and enter into partnership with another agency, with another uh, force. But the choice here is given to us. A tree has no choice. It's pollinated by nature. See? The animal has this mating with its own type. But we, but the soul here, has got a choice. It can, you can choose whatever agency, whatever force you want to give your soul to it and establish this marriage. It's like a marriage really, our soul, which is a spiritual thing. Now I'll tell you what most people of the world do. Of course most people even don't know they have a soul. They, they won't even think about it. But most people, without knowing it, they give their soul to this world. They're born here. They live so many years. They think of nothing but material things. Isn't that right? So what happens? They have given their soul to this world. 
And so the child of that soul, which is a spiritual entity, the child that it produces is not worthy of itself. It is materialism. Imagine our soul give birth to materialism. It's become darkened. There is a, a, a little bit of spiritual entity there. But that spiritual entity has given birth, has, has given itself to this world. Established a relationship with this world. And the child of that product is very unworthy. See? Its father is very low. The mother is the soul. But the father is very unworthy. It's in material things. And so the child is materialism. Now Baha'u'llah tells us. I'm, para I'm just giving you in this form of example. To whom we should give our soul in marriage, in relationship. With whom we should establish a relationship. We should establish a relationship between our souls and the forces of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. In other words, we give ourselves to the influences of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. We open our heart and our soul to the influences of his revelation. Can you imagine? A very much more exalted station than ourselves. The forces of the revelation which he has released in the world. We allow our souls to become fertilized by these forces which he has released. If you let it, because it's up to us. And when you open your heart to the influences of his revelation and let the forces of his revelation fertilize our souls, then our souls will conceive a child which is worthy. And that child, once it is born, it is known, you can call it, the spirit of faith. Our soul has produced the spirit of faith, which is a very, which is the purpose of life, the purpose of creation, the purpose that God has created us for. And Baha'u'llah says, if the station of that soul is revealed to the eyes of men, I'm paraphrasing his word, who has given birth to the spirit of faith, the whole of creation would, will be found dumbfounded. Someone who has given birth to the spirit of faith. Someone who has said, I believe. When you say, I believe, what really has happened is that your soul and the revelation of Baha'u'llah as a result of this mystical intercourse has now produced the child. And you say, I believe. And that child is born. The spirit of faith is born. Now this is the station which God has destined for man. Which can overlook all the other qualities and perfections. Which can and over, not overlook, it can uh, really s dominate over all the other things that we have acquired. When you have the spirit of faith. You know, this lamp in here is lighting, is lighted. Before it was lighted, it was nothing. But when it is lighted, when you look at it, you can't see anything else but the light. It will dominate over all the things. In fact, if you closely look at it, you will see it's full of dust, probably. But you can't see the dust. It has completely overshadowed all the imperfections. Because it has become lighted. Um, of course, you come across beautiful, beautiful uh, chandeliers somewhere, hanging in someone's house. You come across beautiful people in this world, with great qualities and perfections. Really, who are not Baha'is. You come across great, great many people, who live a marvelous life much better than me, I'm sure. They are like as chandeliers, you know, like this beautiful uh, crystal lamp, which is exquisite, but it's not lighted. <laughs> this is an old little bulb or an old little lamp full of dust and full of all kinds of imperfections but it is connected 
that's lighted. And that is the difference. But the real thing to be is to be a chandelier which is lighted. <laughs> that is the real purpose of life. <laughs> to have the qualities and perfections and being exquisite qualities and perfections and also lighted. That is the story of the early or, or the believers, the believers, both early and the present time. To acquire qualities and perfections and to have faith. To have the spirit of faith. Now, this faith, when it is born, when this child is born, we said the spirit of faith is the child which really our soul has given birth to. It has conceived it because, you know, it doesn't happen suddenly also. When you give yourself to the influences of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, it doesn't immediately appear as a spirit of faith. Just like, a, just like a woman who becomes pregnant, doesn't immediately give birth to a child. There must be a period of conception, of growth, of that embryonic growth until it can be born. It takes time. But there comes a time that then you have, no, you have so much sure of it, that you have faith. And you say, I really believe. And you really believe in your heart. I also mentioned, you remember, that when the soul, when the tree comes into being, you remember we talked about the tree, it's first the, you, you plant the seed and then it grows, it doesn't immediately produce a fruit either. You have to wait until it becomes mature. It's the same thing with the soul. A soul cannot immediately recognize and give itself to Baha'u'llah. There is an age for it. There is at least a limit for it that you have to produce that. And that is, you might say, the age of 15, that you uh, will become spiritually obliged to, to, to give, to carry out some of the teachings. Although before that, you are a Baha'i, naturally. A child is a Baha'i. But the, but the obligations uh, is not binding on you until you reach that particular age. Now having said this, that our soul must give birth to a child. Now let us look at nature again. In nature, when a mother gives birth to a child, that's, that, opera, that action of giving birth to, it may be relatively an easy action. Or maybe I shouldn't say that, to give birth to a child is easy. I shouldn't say that. But really, parents know that to give birth to a child is nothing comparing with the after, afterwards. After the child is born is the beginning of all the cares and the attention and the labors and the work that you have to do for that child to protect it constantly. All the time to protect it and help it to grow and mature, it's much more difficult. It's easy to become Baha'i, but it is difficult to grow, to protect the faith, to enable it to grow day by day, and to look after it, and to watch over it, much more difficult. It needs a vigilance which is constant vigilance has to be constant. So that, there we come across again a very new, a new um, challenge which has come to us. Once you have faith, a new challenge come to us. And I have said, I am a Baha'i. What is the next step? So that my faith may grow. And remember, our faith is precious to us. Just as much a child is precious to a mother. And it's also precious to its father. And here is the process of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah is attached very deeply to our faith. He loves a believer. He loves the faithful believer, the person who has faith. 
And his love for him is so great that we cannot ever measure it. The love that Baha'u'llah has for the believers and the outpouring of his love is so great that we cannot visualize in this life. And the sorrow which floods the heart when one person, is his heart, when one person loses his faith or becomes weak in his faith, it brings great sorrows to the heart of the manifestation of God. Such sorrows that are not, that are not comparable ever with all the sufferings which were heaped upon him by the enemies. That is nothing. The sufferings of the enemies is nothing. It mean nothing to Baha'u'llah really, the physical sufferings. And he himself mentions uh, the suffering which comes to the manifestation of God is when one soul who has recognized him does one little thing which is an indication that he is not growing. Just like a, ch a father who sees his son is becoming ill. And he will see it. He notices. He becomes ill. And as soon as he becomes ill, he becomes worried. He becomes unhappy. One believer doing one thing against the faith brought so much sorrow to the heart of Baha'u'llah, to the heart of Abdul Baha, to the heart of Shoghi Effendi. That is beyond our estimation. And if ever one lost his faith, that would be just like a father who laments the passing of his child. His child is dead. Brings great sorrows to the person also. And to Baha'u'llah. I will give you a, an example of this, at least uh, not about Baha'u'llah, but I talk about Shoghi Effendi. You know Shoghi Effendi was a very he was very sensitive, a very sensitive soul, very sensitive heart. He was uh, the guardian of the cause. And you know, of course, uh, must have heard the name of Dorothy Baker, who was one of the hands of the cause, an American lady. And she, of course, um, was involved in a fatal accident where she, she, she was traveling in this comet, which was the one of the first, was the first jet airliner which the British made. And uh, the comet exploded in the air. It wasn't really fully uh, tested. And uh, she, uh, she, was, she was killed. Well, one of the pilgrims was telling us a story. Uh, she was present at the time that the news of the, of the passing on this tragic form of Dorothy Baker was brought to Shoghi Effendi. And Shoghi Effendi was sad and uh, he began to talk about her services and uh, spoke about her for some time that evening and then changed the subject and carried on. Carried on and after all this person has passed away. Then a few days later the news reached Shoghi Effendi that one young girl who was a believer has been with some tricks and some uh, plottings has been taken into the company of the covenant breakers and has joined in marriage with one of them. Now that person is gone, is like a child, like a soul which is dead now, you know, the faith is what I was talking to you about. The faith is gone, is lost. The sorrows which flooded the heart of Shoghi Effendi as a result of this 15 year old girl was so great that for some days he could not come out of his bed and he was so uh, crippled really with this blow. But look, the death of a, of, a, of a hand of the cause was only 15 minutes. It passed by. Nothing. After all, she had ascended to the realms beyond. But the um, defection 
of this girl, losing her faith, dealt such a deadly blow upon him that he could not come and meet with the friends for one or two days. Now this shows how much our faith is, is, is really uh, precious to God, to the manifestation of God and to his disciples, and to, and to Abdul Baha, and to Shoghi Effendi. Well now, we wanted to find out what should we do now. We have just given birth to the spirit of faith. Just like a mother who has birth, given birth to a child. What are we going to do with it now? To enable it to grow. This again we can learn from nature. You want to say something? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. The soul has just given birth to faith. Uh, and uh, he has given himself to Baha'u'llah, really. And as a result of it, he says, I believe. That is when the first spark of faith appears in our hearts. Just like a mother who has given birth to a child. This is just a form of looking at nature to see what happens there. Now, when you look at nature... You will find that the mother who gives birth to a child, the first thing she does, if you notice, she loves that child very much. And the next thing she does, she will feed the child. And the child has never been fed before in his life. Never tasted the, the milk. And none of us can remember what it was like when we first received the milk from our mother. But it must have been some, it must have some effect on us on the child it gets the taste for it and the next time it probably wants uh, it's not going to reject it it becomes more and more fond of that milk to such an extent that it will cry for it afterwards and he wants to drink this milk and this milk make it grow this is nature and the mother will feed the child regularly regularly. Now the same thing applies exactly to our faith. When you say I become a Baha'i, it's a dangerous thing to remain like this and just remain in that state. You must, we must feed our, our faith. We must feed the spirit of faith which is born. We must feed it with some food. And the food for it is the words of God for this age. This is why Baha'u'llah has commanded us. This is one of his commandments. He says you must read, you must recite, he says. Recite my words. Recite my words twice a day. In the morning and in the evening. He, spe he stipulates that. Recite my words in the morning and in the evening. It's just like a mother who says to her child, eat your food two or three times a day. You see how similar it is? And Baha'u'llah mentions to us, if we don't recite, what will happen to us? You can imagine what will happen to us. What will happen if a child does not eat his food? Baha'u'llah says, if you do not read my words, it's a very serious situation. He says, you are not steadfast in the covenant. Uh, our soul, if it is to be healthy, it must be steadfast in the covenant. If it is not, it's a serious um, situation. And this is when the believer becomes confused. He's a Baha'i, yes. But he has never taken a food, or very little. And so he becomes frustrated. He cannot see joy out of his faith and out of life. Just like a person who does not eat his food. I remember a few years ago, one young person came to me and he said, you know, he said, it's one year that I'm a Baha'i. But I don't feel any difference. I'm the same person as before. Can you imagine, when you become a Baha'i, can you imagine what happens? 
we, we have to be different. One has to be very different. Very different. It's a new, it's a new life. This is the second birth that Christ is talking about. The spirit of faith is born. It must be the most exciting thing which happens just like an excitement which comes to a mother. There is no excitement in the world for a mother greater than to have given birth to a child. And this person said, well, I don't feel any excitement. I, I'm a Baha'i for a year, but I've not grown, I've not changed, I'm just like the old days. Uh, I'm not excited about anything. What is wrong with me, he said. Well, you can imagine what's wrong. You know, um, I mentioned to him, I said, have you ever loved somebody? Uh, because you must remember, the faith. You cannot, you cannot only become a Baha'i through your intellectual um, appraisal and intellectual investigations. You might begin with that way, but you have to fall in love, really. Your heart must accept the faith. You must fall in love. It's a falling in love. To be a Baha'i is that you are falling in love. And of course this is a relative term. It varies from person to person. One person is love for Baha'u'llah is uh, not much of a love for another, in another case, of another person. Everyone is in different levels. We are all in different levels. This is a relative term. But to be a Baha'i means that you have come to love Baha'u'llah. This is what it amounts to. You can understand it, yes, you must study it and everything else. I don't know how you become a Baha'i, it's not important. You might become a Baha'i through a purely an intellectual approach. But then, if, you, if your heart does not um, move, and if your heart does not um, fall in love, because I mentioned, we have to give ourselves to, we have to give our soul to the influences of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. It's a, it is just like a marriage. When you are marrying somebody, you love that person. You see? Now here it is, I, this, this young man was telling me, he said that after a year I don't feel any difference. I said, Did you ever, have you ever loved anybody in your life? He said, yes. Now let us see what happened that you love this person. Really, let us examine it, this is nature again. What happens that you come to love somebody? The first thing, you meet that person, isn't that right? And when you meet that person, you like that person. And when you like that person, you come a little closer to that person, isn't that right? You come a little closer. And when you come a little closer, you like him more or like her more. And when you like her more, you come still further closer. And you come closer and closer and closer. And it comes a point that uh, you, want to, you want to know everything about that person. Isn't that right? You want to know everything. And you're going to ask even people, what is this? Tell me all about it. And I'm sure if somebody rings you up in the middle of night, two in the morning, and say, look, I've got some news for you about your friend. Would you like me to tell you? Oh, yes, please tell me. You're not tired of it. You become excited. You see, you are beginning to fall in love with somebody. Oh. And so... This is how you fall in love with some person. So I mentioned to this young man, I said, when you heard of Baha'u'llah and recognized him and said you are a Baha'i, did you ever come a little closer to him? To Baha'u'llah? Did you ever allow yourself to come a little closer to him? No. Did you ever read anything about the history of his revelation, really, to find out what was going on in, his, in all this? Did you try to find out anything about him? No. Did you read any of his writings? No. Did you care to carry out his teachings? Exactly. See, what he has said, let me carry them out. No, he said. Well, what do you expect? You have kept your distance. And now you want to be uh, different. Of course you're not. You're the same person. You're just like a mother who has given birth to a child somehow. But it's gone now. It's not there anymore. It's very little of it left. And this is why I said it's very easy to become a Baha'i. But to grow in the faith is the greatest challenge and the greatest uh, difficulty. 
But we can learn. We can learn from nature and we can learn from the writings of Baha'u'llah. And as I said in the morning, everything that he has said, it fits into nature. Now this very teaching that he tells us, this very commandment, that he tells us we must read his words twice a day, in the morning and in the evening, is just as vital as eating the food for a child. And you see how much similar it is to nature when he says do it twice a day. <coughs> you know in life it's the same thing. If you eat, you, you cannot lump together all your food and eat it once a day. You can't do that. It's not healthy. You eat something in the morning, then that's something that you eat in the morning. You have to give it time to be digested. And when it is digested, then you become hungry again. And it is a sign of digestion is that you have, you're hungry again. Then you will eat again. Baha'u'llah has given us the same commandment. He says, read my words in the morning. Which means, when you read it, you mustn't just read it and forget it. But rather allow it to penetrate into our hearts. Penetrate into our hearts. And... Uh, And when it penetrates in the heart, then the sign of it penetrating in our hearts, what we read, is that when we come home in the evening, you are eager to read again of the writings. This is the sign. If I come home and I'm not eager to read, it means what I have read in the morning, or if I have read it, what I have read in the morning have not penetrated into my heart. And there is again a challenge. What are we going to do? How are we going to enable the words of Baha'u'llah to penetrate into our soul? And now what I'm trying to tell you in a way is this. That in life you have to do so many things to live in order to enable you to live. Isn't that right? In life you can't just say alright I'm going to eat only and then I'm going to live. No, no, you can't do that. You have to do so many things to enable you to live in this life. You have to eat, you have to sleep, you can't do without it. You have to breathe air into your lungs, you have to wash, you have to dress, you have to go shopping, you have to work, you have to have friends if you want to live. You have to do all these things. And if one of them is not done, if I say, I'm not going to shopping ever. I mean, you can't live real. You must go for shopping. You have to do all these things. It's like in electricity. It's like, you know, these switches which are in series. If you put a lot of, a number of switches, one after the other, you must close all the switches so that the current may flow. If one of them is open, Nothing will happen. It's the same thing in the faith. You become a Baha'i, now the, work, the task begins. You have to close switch after switch in order that you may live happily and grow, our faith may grow. And one of them, the first one, was this reading of the writings in the morning and in the evening. It is such an important commandment that nobody can ever emphasize this point enough how important it is to make it a habit for ourselves to read the writings and you know to form a habit is difficult when you are grown up or when you become a Baha'i you've never been reading the writings before so to, to form a habit is difficult it's alright for children to learn it a child will learn it and make a habit of it but to read the writings when you are grown up you have to force yourself at first, until it becomes a second habit. And it doesn't matter, you must, we must not be worried about it. If we, once there is a lapse in this, you may do it for a week and then you forget it. Doesn't matter. Try it again. You forgot it for another week, okay, doesn't matter. God is forgiving, of course it is. You just take one little step forward, it comes to you a thousand meters doesn't matter. Do it again. So that it becomes a habit. So that the goal of a Baha'i really is to become an addict to the writings of Baha'u'llah.
This is the goal. And you know how you become an addict. Now you must know, or must have heard of. I don't think you're addicts yourself to anything. But people who become addicts to drugs. What happens to them is somebody introduces the idea to them. And eventually give them a little piece to try. The child becomes an addict to the milk of the mother. And we have to become an addict to the writings of Baha'u'llah. And I will probably in the course of news, next sessions, we'll talk about it. Of how should we read the words so that we may become really addicts to it. Now, I think when they are children, children can learn this when they are young. And we should teach our children from childhood to make it a habit of reading the writings in the morning and in the evening. Then they grow and it becomes natural for them. Now, there is one point that I must mention here. It's a very important point. What is the writing? We must not mix it with prayers here. We are not talking of prayers. Prayers are different things. We do it differently and I'm not going to talk about it now. Prayer plays a very important part in our life. But reading the writings of Baha'u'llah is very different thing altogether. The writings are those things that you come across in English now. Many of these writings are available to us. The gleanings, the book of gleanings is full of the writings of Baha'u'llah. The tablets of Baha'u'llah lately published by the House of Justice. These are the writings of Baha'u'llah. There are other books which are not prayers of the writings. The Hidden Words is one of the writings of Baha'u'llah. And there is a vast difference between writing, reading the writings and saying prayers. In fact, these two things are sometimes opposite things. Very opposite. A prayer and a, a tablet of Baha'u'llah are opposite things. I will explain to you how. When you say a prayer, you often ask God for something. But when you read the writings, it's God who asks you to do something. It's very different. You see how different it is? And we have to be differentiating this very clearly in our minds. And especially if you are teaching our children. I note that the children of all the Baha'i families, they are taught prayers. You know, most children learn prayers. But we should have a program in every home where we can see that and show the children the difference between reading the writings and saying your prayers. You could say, all right, say a prayer, but let us now read the writings. And pick up something for them, which they can read. So that it becomes a habit for them, and they can distinguish between the two things. In our meetings, and this is my own taste now, if you like call it. This is just the taste, personal taste. I feel we should say prayers, but equally we should read the writings when we gather together in a meeting. When we have a devotional program, you can say prayers, you can read the writings. Now, Baha'u'llah has again here applied the same laws of nature to this particular commandment by telling us that we must not read the writings when we are tired. He said, read as much as you are enjoying it. As soon as you become tired, don't Read it. Do you know what it is like? It's like a mother who says to her child, eat your food as long as you're hungry. As soon as you're full, stop eating. This is it, you see, very natural. All these teachings, as I said, have their origin in nature. Now, we must also I'm, I'm going to, the time is coming 12 o'clock. I think I'm going to tell you a story. There's much we, can, we have to cover in this field. We haven't even touched upon this properly. Of all the things we have to do, as I said, there are a lot of switches we have to close in in order that we can ena enable our souls to experience that growth and that joy of faith, a growing faith, not a static faith. A static faith for a Baha'i is fatal. You know, something which is always the same. <laughs> but he says we must allow our faith to grow day by day. And we must feel it just like a mother who feels that his child is growing. 
and he's happy for it. Now I'm going to tell you a story, which is a true story, and I don't think it's made up. It relates to one of the early believers of Baha'u'llah. Now this is a very well-known, one of the well-known apostles of Baha'u'llah. He's one of the apostles of Baha'u'llah was called Zainul Muqarrabin. It doesn't matter now the name to you. He was one of the outstanding disciples of Baha'u'llah. One who really had a great, great um, qualities of knowledge and learning. And his uh, particular work was, at one stage in his life, was to transcribe the writings. You know, transcribing the writings was a very important task. Because when revelation came to Baha'u'llah and this amanuensis would write it very fast, so fast that you cannot read it. Revelation writings, you can look at revelation writings, it's, it's, it's not possible to read it. The way revelation came to him was so fast. Uh, and there is no shorthand in Persian or Arabic languages. That his amanuensis had to, had to use a, s a special text fast. Um, he had very large sheets of paper, very large sheets, piles of them. And when he was writing, he found out that you cannot use, if you, if you hold a pen in your hand, and normally we used to hold a pen in our hands and we begin to write by moving our fingers when you're writing. You move your, your fingers. When you move your fingers, you can't write very fast. But he used to hold a pen like this within his, within his fingers, but he wouldn't move his fingers when he was writing. He would move his wrist. And so you can write big, one letter would maybe, one word would take the whole line maybe. And it would be, each word would go into each other. All the words would go into each other. Quick, 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 he would write them down. Because remember, Revelation came at the speed of 1,000 verses in an hour. The kitab e iqan was probably revealed in three or four hours. Because when the man, when this person sent the questions to Baha'u'llah in writing, 48 hours later the book of certitude in, the, in its original form, in the handwriting of Abdul Baha, was presented to him. It didn't mean it took 48 hours to be revealed. It meant that Baha'u'llah had to eat, had to sleep, had to do other things during that period. Three or four hours. The revelation is like this. And so when it was written down very fast, then he had to go to his room, the secretary of Baha'u'llah, the amanuenses of Baha'u'llah, and rewrite it again properly. And then he would bring it to Baha'u'llah. And Baha'u'llah often would pace up and down the room and re-reveal that tablet as if he knew it all by heart. And this man would check it. And any corrections were made. And then when it was properly done, then there were people who would transcribe it because there were no typewriters in those days or no printing machine. People were transcribing. Abdul Baha was one of those people who used to transcribe the writings during Baha'u'llah's ministry. Now this man that I'm going to tell you a story of and we are getting late uh, was one of those who used to transcribe the writings. But he was a very meticulous man, very meticulous in his work of transcription. So meticulous that he used to check it all. Everything he wrote, he used to check it with his son. He would, he would call him after a few pages that he would write. He would call his son and the son would come and read for him the original tablet. And then he would check what he has written. And this is how the writing of Zainul Muqarrabin, anything you find in his handwriting is authentic. It's, it's a standard for Baha'i publications. You always compare every publication with his handwriting. Now, he had a great sense of humor, the Zainul Mugarabi. And he often came to the presence of Baha'u'llah and he always had some humorous remarks to make. And as I said, Baha'u'llah loved humor, good humor. One day he came into the presence of Baha'u'llah and he said, you know, he said to Baha'u'llah, we in our family, we, of course, carry out your teachings, but we are particularly have a favorite amongst your teachings. Each one of us have a favorite uh, of one of your teachings. And uh, so Baha'u'llah said, well, what are they? Well, he said, my son has a very special favorite. He said, every day I write uh, uh, many, many pages, because this was his work, this man's work. He said, I, I write and write and write and then when it's all finished, I call my son 
uh, to come and to read for me the writings so that I can check them. So he comes in, he reads one page and then he turns to me and he says, Father, I am tired and Baha'u'llah says when you're tired you must not read the writings. <laughs> this is his favorite teaching. <laughs> And Baha'u'llah laughed very much. <coughs> then he said, my wife has another favorite. Uh, when I have done a lot of work and very tired and exhausted, I say to her, would you make us a cup of tea, please? She says, go and make it yourself. Baha'u'llah says, men and women are equal. <laughs> this is her favorite. <laughs> well now, friends, I think we'll leave it here. And we will come back, do we come back this afternoon, sometime? At what time? Maybe you want to announce it so that we can... Um... Uh, Ted, you have given me all these papers and some of them are your indexing notes on it. Here we are. So I wouldn't have that. Well... You all must have been nourishing uh, very well, huh? have been nourished very well, I should say. <laughs> um, well, I think we better continue the uh, subject. We were discussing or talking about still the reading of the writings, the reciting of the writings of Baha'u'llah in the evening and in the morning. And uh, <coughs> we said it's the spiritual food. But it is very important that we should uh, remember that what we read, what we recite, should really, we should allow it to penetrate into our hearts. And I am not, uh, uh, I'm not going to give you any <laughs> methods for doing that because after all, every individual is different. But uh, when we read the writings, if we do not allow it to penetrate into our hearts, as I mentioned, it's just like a food that you take which you don't digest it. And it is of no value. You know, <coughs> if, if we want the words of God to penetrate into our hearts, we must first know something about the word of God and not to look upon it as the words which we ordinarily read in our daily life because we are all so much engaged in the act of reading. We are so good readers. Uh, we begin uh, a book and we end it up quickly or after a short while and uh, I've seen people who get into a train and they open a book and till the end of the journey they're reading now you can't do that with the words of God if you want to read it in that way it's no use we have to uh, know whose words we are reading and this is the key to it whose words is it that we are reading and here it opens up really this, this subject now opens up a vast um, many questions. Uh, whose words am I reading? Uh, if somebody says, well, I believe that Baha'u'llah is the most, is, his words are the wisest counsel that anybody can give. Or he says, Baha'u'llah's words are the most profound words that you can find. Or if he says that Baha'u'llah's words are um, having all the solutions of the problems of the world within it, this is not at all what Baha'u'llah's words are. This is not what Baha'u'llah's words are. He is not the wisest man, he is not the greatest man, he is not the uh, most profound 
uh, learned person <laughs> he is the voice of our creator you see now he is the voice of our creator he is the supreme manifestation of God you cannot compare it with anything that man has ever had or has ever got except the manifestations of the past whose words uh, we don't have adequately now here we see therefore our attitude has to be right when we read the writings whose words am I reading this is the words of my creator not until you believe that can those words penetrate into your heart but if you believe that then when you open the book when you touch the book it means something to you it already has moved you when you touch the book when you handle it when you open it you open it with feelings of joy and excitement I'm reading the words of my creator you know in this life our creator that's God communicates with his creation all creation not only man but all creation every created thing God communicates with it but this communication is in the form uh, in different forms for example and when I say God by the way let us be very make it, make it very clear uh, I mentioned this morning we are not talking of the essence of God you cannot talk about it even the essence of God we will never understand it uh, the manifestations of God do not understand it let us let alone us you are not talking of the essence of God the essence of God can have no connection whatsoever with his creation if it ever has any connection with the creation uh, then he ceases to be God you cannot attribute anything in his essence uh, these are some of the profound statements that you will find in the writings you cannot attribute anything to God in his essence the minute you say God is the all-knowing you, you limit him immediately the essence of God you're talking about because you're limiting him when we talk about God it is God which is revealed in this creation which is manifested in this creation not the essence of God so let us make this point clear so when we say that God uh, communicates with this with all this creation man and other creation uh, when we look at nature we find this is true for example you will find God communicates with all the living creatures through the rays of the Sun this is the way he communicates to them communicates energy to them which enables them to grow the energy comes from there and that is what it is it's a form of communication pouring out its energy and you know when, uh, when the energy is poured out from the Sun upon all created things those created things which are alive they yearn for that energy in their in their own in their own ways they yearn for it they long for it you know a tree which is living a tree will stretch its boughs and branches towards the Sun uh, this is uh, this is uh, just yearning for 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 the uh, for this energy to reach it as if it's conscious uh, that these energies are giving it life but it can't help it it just stretches itself towards the Sun and if it doesn't it's dead now on the other hand you realize that whether they whether the rays of the Sun pour upon the tree whether whether the Sun whether the tree whether the tree stretches its branches or not still the Sun is pouring its energies upon it but a tree which does not stretch itself it's dead you see it's a two-way communication this is the, this is prayer you know prayer this is the state of prayer for man the tree when it when it stretches itself towards the Sun it's exactly what the soul does when he prays to his Creator now a prayer is not something that uh, you always ask God for something the best prayer is the one that you don't want anything a prayer without any desire a prayer of praise and glorification of God 
is the best form of prayer. And if you look at the writings of Baha'u'llah and uh, Bab and Abdul Baha, you will find that the greater part of their prayers is that of praise and glorification of God. Just like the sun, like the tree, which stretches its boughs and branches as if it is praising its, uh, its creator, it's the sun, the rays of the sun. Uh, the real uh, prayer for man is to stretch its spiritual um, branches and boughs and branches, the spiritual arms, the spiritual heart, towards his creator and praise and glorify him. This is the best form of prayer. But what I was saying is that God communicates with his creation and the sun pouring out its energies is one form of that communication and, without, and it is constant. Now, uh, the tree of course is bound by the laws of nature to respond in this way. It doesn't have any voluntary uh, power. Uh, it cannot refuse to do it. This is the way it's made. This isn't how nature made it. But we have the choice. Again, remember, man has the choice. You have the choice of either turning to God or not. Absolutely. Uh, if you turn towards God, well, the powers will be released. Now, I mentioned that God communicates with his creation. But how does he communicate with our souls? Because our souls is not subject to the laws of nature. Everything is subject to the laws of nature, which is physical. Our bodies are subject to the laws of nature. But our soul is not. Our soul is uh, subject to the laws of the covenant of God. And there you will find there is a covenant between God and man at, in the act of creation. Which means that uh, we, have to, we have to turn to him. He releases to us spiritual energies through the word of God, through the word of his messengers. And we have, like the tree, to stretch ourselves towards it and want to receive it and open our hearts to it. So the way he communicates to us, to our souls, is through the instrumentality of the words of Baha'u'llah in this age. So you see, this is God communicating with us, with our souls. It's a communication. And so when you look at the words, when you open the book, and you can, if you look at it in that light, and as you open the book and you look at the words and say, this is how my creator is communicating with me, is talking to me talking to me, asking me to do certain things, this is what it is, this is the writings, he asks you to do, what you, to do certain things, then it becomes um, a very potent uh, influence, it will produce a potent influence up, uh, upon our hearts to r say these words, to read these words, to recite these words with great excitement, to approach it with great reverence. This is the word of my creator. And then those words can penetrate into our hearts. And there is also to realize that the words of God is very much unlike the word of man is created. bad thing to repeat things, you know. You have got the story of repeating, haven't you? Have you heard? Yes. You know about it. Very good. Uh, repeating is, is not a bad thing because we often forget things. But I was saying this morning, this afternoon, that we must allow the words of God to penetrate into our hearts. And uh, if we do not, if, we do, if the words do not penetrate into our hearts, then uh, it is like food that you eat which is not digested. But to allow the word to penetrate, we must really have the knowledge and the faith in whose words we are reading. It's very important to know whose words we are reading. They are not the words of a very wise man or the wisest man or the most profound learned personality that you are reading, but it is the words of your Creator. Far, far above far, far beyond any human understanding are the words of God. And that uh, 
I was mentioning that God communicates to uh, his creation. Communicates. This communication is for all created things. You remember I was telling you the story of the sun pouring out its energies upon all uh, vegetables and animals and every created thing. That's the way it communicates. And it, it, it sends out all the life-giving energies. But um, the tree must stretch its boughs and branches before the sun. And if it doesn't, then it is dead. Whether it does it or whether it doesn't, the sun is pouring out its energies. But a tree which does not stretch forward is dead. And the same thing is with the soul. Our souls must want to, must yearn for God to praise and glorify Him. This is the best form of prayer. Uh, the more you get closer to Baha'u'llah, the more you want to praise and glorify uh, God. Now, this is one aspect of the word which I mentioned. We must remember. So when you open the book, you must remember the joy that you are opening the words that he is talking to us. He is communicating with us. This is the way we should think about it. This will help us to, uh, this will help us to have the vision of what we are reading. And that will penetrate, that will affect us, that will be influencing us. Uh, now I was going to talk about the, the word of God and then the, the sound machine broke down. And I want to therefore repeat myself here in case they want to record it. Is that the words which are um, revealed by the manifestation of God. These words are not the product of learning and knowledge. You know, if you are a learned man and if you want to write a book, you have to have a lot of education behind you, you have to make a lot of research, you have to go and make investigations here and there, and after a lot of studies, then you want to write something, and then even conditions must be right, you can't write at any time, everything must be peaceful and loving and beautiful, and oh, all the surroundings must be beautiful so that you can write something, and then when you write, Oh, you will find it's all kinds of wrong things, false with it, you tear it up again, you write again, and you go over and over it again and again, and after a year you might write something. And then, even then, um, anybody will tell you, whoever writes something will tell you, Oh, I could have done much better now, and I think of it, it's not good, you know. This is what man is. But the manifestation of God, the words that are revealed to him, is not something that he has learned it, it comes to him. Uh, you know how a radio receiver works? It just, uh, right now that we are sitting in here, in this room, there are, the room is full of electromagnetic waves, full of radio waves. But we are not sensible, sensitive to it. We don't feel it, we don't get it, we don't receive it. But you have a, you have a receiving set here, and it cannot help but to pour out what it receives. It tells you everything. This is exactly what happens when revelation comes to the manifestations of God. But I was mentioning that really the soul of the manifestation of God, because we were talking about the soul this morning, the soul of the manifestation of God is different from us in that it has no beginning. Our soul has a beginning and it begins at the time of conception. But the soul of the manifestation of God uh, has been created at a time that has no beginning. And therefore when it comes into this world it has all the knowledge it has all the powers, but they are latent. They are, they, are, they are latent. It becomes active. When we say, as Baha'is, we now say these things, we say Baha'u'llah received his mission when he was in the Siyah Chal. It means that it became active. The power was there. Abdul Baha in one of his tablets mentions, he says, the manifestation of God is a manifestation from the time he's born. And then he describes him as a light which is hidden under a bushel. You put a cover on a light, the light is inside him. The cover is taken off when he receives that intimation from God, that he is now to, um, to announce it. And even then he doesn't announce it right away, it will take some time. Uh, in another tablet, Abdul Baha says that uh, a manifestation of God before his time comes to declare his mission, is like a man who is asleep. A man who is asleep has all the powers, but it is latent. 
Now you should go and read a passage in the some answered questions to, be, to make this clear. Because some of the believers <coughs> say that, well, Baha'u'llah has said, for instance, in the tablet to the king of Persia, <coughs> he says that, I was, O oh king, I was but a man. These are, I'm paraphrasing his words, very close to it though. I was but a man like others, asleep upon my couch, when lo, the breezes of the all-merciful were wafted upon me and gave me the knowledge of all that has been. And then Baha'u'llah says, this thing is not from me, but from God, the Almighty, and so forth. And some people think that this means that Baha'u'llah did not know anything until the call came to him. <coughs> now you go and read some answered questions. Abdul Baha gives the meaning of this particular passage in some answered questions. And he says, it does not mean this, that Baha'u'llah did not know of his station or did not have these powers within him. He says it's only indicating that his revelation was not to be announced, that it was a latent thing, it was not put, uh, to become active. And so, <coughs> Baha'u'llah in his own tablets and his writings, in some of his writings he talks about his childhood. He says, when I was a child, I saw the ocean of revelation, the ocean uh, of, of utterance, the ocean of utterance was surging within me, and it never left me. You see? Now, the believers at the time of the Bab had recognized Baha'u'llah as being him whom God shall make manifest that the Bab had come to announce his coming. During the lifetime of the Bab, they had discovered that. Tahereh was one of them. Tahereh knew that Baha'u'llah was the manifestation of God, um, the supreme manifestation of God. Qudus knew this. Mullah Hussein had recognized this. Some of the believers who went to the conference of Badasht, you know that was a conference that some of you must have studied and known, that uh, some of the leading uh, members of the Babi community gathered in this conference and Baha'u'llah was among them. In those days, Baha'u'llah uh, did not want to come into the public attention. Bab did not want him to come into the public attention. He focused attention upon others so that people will not uh, turn to Baha'u'llah. This was for protection and also for tests. Man must find out the truth for himself. If the Bab had said, all right, this is Baha'u'llah, you can turn to him, this would not have been fair. People have to find him. And so there was, uh, there, was, there was a definite and a deliberate uh, plan of not to uh, bring Baha'u'llah into the public attention. And yet in the conference of Badash, those who were attending, they were amazed and astonished to see how Quddus and Tahereh and others, or some Quddus and Tahereh particularly, who were aware of the station of Baha'u'llah, they were, these believers were amazed at the way they were showing reverence towards Baha'u'llah, a reverence that they had never shown to the Baal. You see? And they were astonished at this. Now you see the disciples of the Baal, those who had spiritual eyes, they knew who Baha'u'llah was. Now of course Baha'u'llah knew it himself. There's no doubt about it. Now I'll give you one example to prove it for you if you want to know, because this gentleman was asking me there. When the Bab was in the mountains of Azerbaijan, in prison, um, one of his disciples went to see him. And this, his name was Sheikh Hassan Zunuzi, you can read it in the Nabil's narratives. When he went to see the Bab, the Bab said to him, you are a very lucky person. Because you are going to, to see, you are going to behold the face of him whom God shall make manifest in the city of Karbala which is in Iraq. Well, that must have been a tremendous uh, <laughs> excitement for this, young, for this man. And of course this man was living in Karbala. And so he went back to his town and he lived there. And you know Baha'u'llah went to the city of Karbala one year before he went to the Siachal of Tehran when we say the birth of Revelation took place. One year before that, he went to Karbala. And when, when he was in Karbala, in one of the shrines, Islamic shrine, Baha'u'llah spotted this man. He saw Shaykh Hassan. And Baha'u'llah went to Shaykh Hassan, 
You read the story in the in the in the null breakers. He went to Sheikh Hassan and he said to him, Praise be to God, I'm paraphrasing his words, that you have attained and beheld the face of him whom God shall make manifest, the promised Hussein as he put it. This man was so startled at this revelation, suddenly remembered, suddenly saw, recognized, and he went to go down on his knees before Baha'u'llah. And Baha'u'llah stopped him immediately. And he said, no, not now. He said, keep this secret in your heart. This secret will become open and clear and divulged in Baghdad. Keep it to yourself. Now that was a year before he declared his mission. Before he received, as we say, the intimation of his message. <clears throat> now, what I was trying to say is that the soul of the manifestation of God has all the knowledge within it. From the time that it is born. And this is where the revelation comes. When revelation came to Baha'u'llah, it wasn't a question of, oh well now, let me think what is the best word to use here. It wasn't like this. He couldn't do that. The word which came from him and flowed from him so rapidly, so in, in great profusion, with such great profusion, that as I said this morning, within one hour he would reveal 1,000 verses. To such an extent that his secretary was not capable of recording them. You should look at those revelation writings. And even though you don't know Persian or Arabic, there is no question that you say this is not any, this is not a language. It's written, it's a lot of lines, it's drawn. The lines that they're all is written so fast that all the words have gone into each other. And uh, within one hour, 1,000 verses. And he wouldn't be able to say to his secretary, he would never say to his secretary, Oh, look here, will you change that word for me and put such and such a word in his place? In fact, once a word came out of the mouth of Baha'u'llah, he himself was unable to change it. He couldn't change it. It is the word of God, the way it is revealed. You can't change it. It's like a radio receiver. When, when it says something, you can't take it back. You see? This is how revelation has come. And as soon as that word is uttered, that word becomes creative. Baha'u'llah says that uh, uh, the word which was revealed by him, the word of God, has infinite meanings within it. Infinite. Every word that you see, you mustn't consider it, oh well this is a word. Because the word has two sides to it. One is the outward form of the word which is part of language. And it is man-made. But inside that, within it, is, is placed the powers and divine powers. Uh, it's like a stream which flows. If you ever stand in, a st in front of a stream, it never exhausted. It continues to run. The same thing is the powers within the world. It never, you can exhaust it. You can never exhaust the power. You can never exhaust the meaning of it even. And Baha'u'llah mentions in some of his tablets that the word of God uh, has so many meanings and significances uh, that it can never be exhausted. You can't say, well, this word means this and that's it. Of course, for us, we are not in a position to know the meanings of all the things except to understand it in its, outer, in, in its outward form. I mean, you read the writings and that means something to you. And that's what we understand of it. Uh, but Baha'u'llah says every word has meanings beyond our comprehension. And I will give you an example of this um, and explain this to you, how a word of God can have so many meanings and significances. You know, once Baha'u'llah was uh, trying to give the meaning of some words when somebody asked him a question, uh, he tried to answer him by, uh, he wanted to know what was the meaning of a certain word uh, which is revealed in the Quran for instance and Baha'u'llah said oh this word has many meanings and he said it means this and it means this and it means another thing and it means another thing and he gives on various meanings after meanings of that word and then he says you can never exhaust it he says if I had ten secretaries these are all these are exactly how he describes it he said if I had ten secretaries ten of them ten of them remember standing before me 
For one or two years, I could dictate to them the meaning of this word and it would not be exhausted. Now you see, the, you see the great ocean which is flowing within it, within the words. Now to understand that, we can understand that if you look at nature. Nature gives us the, the answer to this. You look at nature. You know the rays of the sun. When the sun emanates the rays, it's like the, it's like the manifestation of God revealing the words. It's the same thing. Uh, the rays of the sun carry their energy. They carry the energy of the sun to us. And the same thing is with the Word of God. It carries with it powers, enormous powers. Now if you look at the ray of the sun, you go and examine the intensity of the ray beside the sun, if you ever go, could go there. Say for example, you were able to. You will find that if you go near the sun to want to measure the energies which are latent within one ray, it will destroy you right away. It will consume you. It is so powerful, the energies within the ray at the, at near the sun, that it will immediately destroy you. Now come down into space. You still find out that the energies are so high, although it's not as high as close to the sun. But it is so high that it will again destroy you, unless you are having your protective clothes. And when you measure the energy, you will find it's enormous energies. You come down further into, into the atmosphere and under the atmosphere and there you will find the same ray which you couldn't bear its heat and its energies up there. Now in here they manifest, it manifests its rays, its heat and its, uh, its light uh, to a, in a faint measure with a faint, a faint glimmer of light that you can bear it. But it's the same ray. It's the same ray which comes down from the sun, but as it reaches us here, it gives us its minimum energy. Now that's exactly the same thing with the Word of God. The Word of God has infinite meanings, infinite power within it, which we cannot feel it in this life. We can only feel and receive a limited measure of it in this life. We are bound by limitations of our existence. We are limited in our, in our understanding, in our existence. We only receive a limited measure of the powers and the significances of the words. But as you go up into the spiritual worlds of God, higher and higher, these words assume greater and greater significances, greater and greater powers. What we understand of one of the words of Baha'u'llah today in this life, compared with what we understand of that same word in the next life, is nothing, is insignificant, what we learn here. For instance, even you think of the attributes of God is the same thing. You talk about love. Love is one of the attributes of God. In this life we understand of love in certain ways and feel it in certain ways. But in the spiritual worlds of God, the intensity of that same attribute is so much that our understanding here is nothing comparing with what it would be. And then, the worlds of God are infinite in range. It's not just you go to the next world and everything stops. It's continuous progress. The soul of man will continuously progress. As long as God exists, man will progress towards him. But you will never reach it. So you see, it's an, uh, the, the, the creation, the picture of creation is very beautiful. It is constantly progressing. This morning we were talking about the souls being graded into different grades. But that each one will progress in its own realm, in its own kingdom, in its own rank. It will progress all the time growing. Somebody was asking me, can a soul who is in a certain rank. As we decided this morning, we talked about the, what Baha'u'llah says that in the next life the souls are divided into groups and into, they are graded, they are in different grades, different, different levels and how those who are on a higher level will understand those who are on a lower level and those who are on a lower level will not understand those who are on a higher level. And that he wanted to know whether, I don't know whether it was a lady or a gentleman, he said, can we, can a, can a soul from one level, can it ever progress to another level? Or will it only progress in its own level? There again, we don't know these things. 
We cannot be sure of any of these things. All we know is that everything progresses on its own level, in its own level, constantly. But you look at life and you might find an answer in this nature. Again, as I said, in nature gives us a lot of clues. In life, say that you are a very rich person. Say there is a man who is very, very rich, multimillionaire or whatever you call him. And then he, he hears that there was a relation of his somewhere in the world who is destitute, living in absolute poverty. What will he do? I don't know, but usually, probably he will say, look here, you are my relation, you are my cousin, I am very rich, I will give you some of my riches, you come to me. You see now, he pulls him up from his condition of destitute. It is possible that in the next life, those souls who are holy souls will have such influence as to bring people up to on higher levels. Well, Baha'u'llah has promised us that those who have believed in the cause, their parents for instance, and some of their relations, who have not, in other words, they'll be pulled up straight away and will be immersed just like the believers have this great station which is destined for them. And this is so strong, this, this, this uh, link, this relationship, uh, that in one of his tablets he talks about the Persian ambassador in Turkey, who was one of his greatest enemies, Mirza Hussein Khan, Mashir al he was one of the greatest enemies of Baha'u'llah. He was the one who was, uh, became an instrument really in making all these exiles for him, exiled him from place to place and eventually he, um, he influenced the, the authorities to exile him to Akka. And, uh, but then, Somehow he, towards the end of his life, he changed his attitude. But Baha'u'llah in one of his tablets says, maybe God will forgive him. Because one of his relations is a believer. Now you see now, <laughs> these are some of the clues that you can get. Uh, and might give us some ideas of how God in the next life will work. But anyhow, we have been straying a little bit away from our discussion, which was about the words of God. We were talking about the... Uh, the power which is latent within every word. So when you read the words of Baha'u'llah, do not think of it as just what you, well this is a word, but remember this word assumes greater and greater powers in the next life. Uh, it seems that in the next life, we know not know, but in the next life the word of God becomes the, becomes the uh, vivifying forces for the souls of men. In the same way that in this life, Light becomes the force of energy, energy giving light. Life gives energy to us. And the word of God in the next life becomes the instrument maybe which will shed its powers and feed the souls of men in the next life. That our attributes that we had to acquire in this life, you remember we were saying that we should acquire spiritual qualities. That these spiritual qualities will become our spiritual limbs and organs shall we say in this example with which we can grow. Now, what will become maybe the vehicle? And this is only my understanding. Now, this is my understanding. It's nothing to do with the writings. I must make it very clear. That the Word of God becomes like the rays of the sun here, which gives you light and energies for our growth. That the Word of God in the next life are the, are the power, is the power with which our qualities and attributes, which we have acquired in this life, becomes active. And they grow as a result of it. And, and, and man will grow, the soul will grow as a result of it in the spiritual words of God. In other words, the word of God becomes like the light uh, which is shed from the sun upon us. So you see, we must attach a great importance to, this, to the potency of the word when we read the writings in the morning and in the evening. And so now you can see as I am saying these things to you, can you imagine what it means to open a Baha'i book, which is the writings of Baha'u'llah, what it means really? Do you realize what it means? Really? What are you doing? You're opening a book. You're opening something where the words are revealed to us from our Creator. He's talking to us. And every word is charged with immense powers, which we 
can only appreciate a little bit of it in this life. Now when you read the words in this way, it will penetrate into your heart. And then I wanted to mention another thing which is also important. And that is that we must really become conscious of the greatness of this revelation. The revelation of Baha'u'llah. Um, I mentioned, I think yesterday somewhere, I don't know where it was, a story of a very beautiful Persian story of a drop of rain. I don't know whether it was last night, I forget it. But anyhow, a drop of rain. A drop of rain uh, in this Persian poem is described as a drop of rain was falling down from the clouds and it saw and it was very proud of itself because it was the water of life and water is the most precious element in life and so it was proud proudly coming down until it saw the ocean <laughs> you know and when it saw the ocean it said, it exclaimed, he said, if this exists, what am I? And when he said this, when he said this, the ocean loved it and drew the, 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 the drop to itself. And the drop became part of the ocean and made that drop to become the companion of the pearl. You see, God loves humility from man. Uh, you see, one of the attributes of God, uh, God has all the attributes except one, and that is humility. By virtue of being the sovereign Lord of all, he cannot be humble. Servitude is not his attribute. And if man has the attribute of servitude, this would please him. Because, you know, in this life, after a hundred years, fifty years, uh, sixty years of life that we live here and when we go what do we carry with us into the next world? The product of our services, of our work, of our qualities, whatever it is you present it. This is what I have. This is what I brought. Now none of these things are pleasing to God perhaps because he has them all. If you say I have a great knowledge he says oh I, he, he, this is nothing. It's like a drop as against that ocean. Any quality that you have, he has much greater. Now if you want to give a gift to a friend, and you want to make sure that the friend loves the gift and appreciates it, you must give him something that he hasn't got. <laughs> then it will be pleasing. But whatever you have, he has it already. You go and give him your knowledge, he has much more of that. Give him virtues, he has more of that. But one thing that he hasn't got is servitude and humility. And if you give it to him, this is what is pleasing. So, when, not until we see the ocean of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, just like the drop did, can we realize we are drops. <laughs> you see? Until we see that great, the greatness of this revelation, we cannot see our own smallness. We cannot become humble. True humility comes when you see uh, the great ocean of Baha'u'llah's revelation. And then we become humble. And it is then that we realize what a day we are living in. If we look at the, if you look at the um, writings, if you look at the writings of the Baal, and you see the way he has extolled the station of Baha'u'llah, we will be astonished to see how the Baal has extolled the station of Baha'u'llah, the supreme manifestation of God for this age. And who was the Bab? The Bab himself was a manifestation of God. He was the king of messengers, Baha'u'llah says. And yet he says he is the greatest, he, is, he says he is the humblest servant, the Bab says, at the threshold of Baha'u'llah. 
Now you see these things will stagger the imagination. The Bab mentions that um, if you read all his writings and if you read one word which is uttered by him whom God shall make manifest that word is much more exalted than all that he had revealed. You know, Christ said that, you see, all the prophets who have come, all the manifestations of God who have come, from the time that history shows, up to and including Muhammad, they have come to give the prophecies of the coming of the day of God. Isn't that right? And Muhammad was the seal of the prophets. Means that after him there would be no more prophets. Prophets in the sense of giving prophecies. Their job was to give the prophecies. The mission of Christ was to prepare the people for the coming of the Father. For the coming, he said, he'll come in the glory of the Father. You see, Christ says he has come in the station of the Son, for instance. This is only a, to indicate his, that he had a relationship with God. That's the only way he described it. Muhammad described himself as a messenger of God. To just describe a relationship with God. That he was sent as a messenger. Christ said he was sent as a son. You know, a son has the authority of the Father with him. But he made it very clear that the Father knew everything. It was he who had sent him. And Baha'u'llah says, the Father has come. You read the Old Testament. You read the New Testament. They are all full of the glories of the coming of the day of God. When God himself would walk with man. You know, just literally, it's in the Bible, it's in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. In the Quran, there are many passages in which, many, many passages, many, many parts of the Quran deals with the coming of the day that man will meet his God. Now, of course, God, we know, we, let, let us not talk about the essence of God. But God has manifested himself in fullness today. In the past revelations. He had manifested himself only to a small extent, to the capacity of the people of the time. But today, God has manifested in his fullness. And yet Baha'u'llah says that his revelation, which is the full revelation of God, he has only released to us an infinitesimal of that glory with which he was invested. But it is the full revelation of God. That's why he says it's the day of God. We must not... Uh, compare it with the revelations of the past. And this is why Shoghi Effendi wrote that his immortal work, the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, which is regarded as his will and testament. You read that, and where you can find such staggering station, statements about the station of Baha'u'llah, and the station of this day. We must read those things and meditate upon it. When Baha'u'llah mentions that the prophets and the chosen ones of those days were longing to be in this day for one moment. One moment of it. You know in one of his tablets, and again Shoghi Effendi has translated this into English. You will read it also in the Advent of Divine Justice. You know the last few pages of the Advent of Divine Justice. Go and look at it. The last few pages which was printed in italics. Shoghi Effendi has gleaned from the writings of Baha'u'llah so many passages to, to uh, uh, impress upon us of the loftiness of the station of Baha'u'llah and the greatness of his revelation. You know, in one of those passages which he has translated, and it's only one passage he has translated out of thousands. What you see in the, what you see in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah is only, is only an ex a sample of what Baha'u'llah has said in so many of his tablets, he picks up one of them and he puts it there for you. And you read all these passages which Yogi Effendi has enumerated one after the other, showing the greatness of this revelation. In one of his, he says, in, you know one of these uh, tablets Baha'u'llah mentions, this is what Yogi Effendi has translated, he mentions that the purpose of creation of man, what was it, he says, what was, Baha'u'llah says, the purpose of creation of man. Why did God create man? And you know how many years ago God created man? Thousands of millions of years ago? It wasn't a thousand years ago. Millions of years ago. He has created us and gradually we have developed and developed to the point. 
Why did he create us? Do you know why? He says, God has created man so that Baha'u'llah may reveal himself and bring his revelation to us. That is why God has created us, so that Baha'u'llah may come with his revelation. This is the purpose of creation. <laughs> now you see what a day we are living in? Really, if you think about it, you could go even crazy when you read the writings and see the station of Baha'u'llah, the staggering station and the greatness of this revelation. Baha'u'llah mentions in one of his tablets, he says that all the worlds of God are uh, addressing this earth, this earth, this physical earth, and saying, I'm paraphrasing his words, Blessed art thou, O earth, that thou hast been made the footstool of thy God. It's a tremendous statement. Baha'u'llah mentions that how in this day he was animated by the most great spirit, as he puts it. The most great spirit. This was what animating him. We don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's God. That he manifested himself for 40 years on this earth in the form of a human temple. The same force which was responsible for all that is creation of all the earths and heavens manifested itself in the form of a human temple. The day of God himself has come. I, I think that you should study it and you should meditate upon it. And then we will recognize what a great revelation this is. In one of his tablets, Baha'u'llah mentions, he says, if the Bab was here today, in his day, do you know what he would have done? He said, if the Bab was present today, he would act as, one, as his amanuensis, as his secretary of Baha'u'llah. He would sit down there and write, this, 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 write the writings. A manifestation of God. The Bab himself was the only person, an Abdul Baha, and Shoghi Effendi really, who recognized the greatness of this revelation. We cannot. The Bab mentioned is in his writings, he says that um, he prepared his followers for the coming of Baha'u'llah. And he says to his followers, the things they should do and the things they shouldn't do. Even on small, on, a, on small matters, how they should behave. Because the Bab made them to understand that him whom God shall mani make manifest was already living among them. And that he said to the, his followers, now you must behave so well uh, that the Babis were forbidden to ever engage in any argument with each other. Because he, they, he said, you might be in the presence of him whom God shall make manifest and that would displease him. You know, this is the way he protected him. Protected the believers. He said, if you go out of your house to the Babis, if, if any of the Babis, if any of the followers of the Bab went out of their houses, they had to be dressed in the most the best suits they have to wear. Always the Babis came out of their houses in their best suits. Because you never know, you might come in contact with him whom God shall make manifest. And he would be displeased if he sees you in this way. He told his followers not to smoke. Because you might smoke and that would be displeasing. You might come in contact with him whom God shall make manifest. You see the way he prepared his people for it? He said, no one should write anything. Uh, about the faith or about uh, except in praise of him whom God shall make manifest that's all you can write he brought in such restrictions to his followers he even told them they shouldn't eat onions or garlic because they might come in contact with him whom God shall make manifest and that would displease him he said they should never, if ever, went to the presence of him whom God shall make manifest, they should never ask him a question. Because your questions could be something so stupid that might displease him. He said, any questions you have, ask of me. And of course, Baha'u'llah has forgiven all of these things. He has said, ask questions, and he has relaxed all those restrictions. But uh, 
This is what I, I was trying to explain to you. The exalted nature of this revelation. That we should not consider it as just one of the extensions of the past revelations. It's the day of God. And really when you think of it, we, uh, we will realize what a great, great blessing it is that each one of us have been led to this great ocean. And I am talking about myself without deserving it. Entirely. Just been led to this great ocean. You know there are 6,000 million people in the world. <laughs> well, look at it. And who are we? We are those people who have been chosen in that way. Somehow. For some reason. We will never understand why. To have recognized this day. And it is not the great men, great peoples of the world who will recognize him now. It is us. The meek and the humble. This is always the way. The meek and the humble shall inherit the earth. The great men of the world will come in the future. They'll come tomorrow. But today is our day. Baha'u'llah once he was in, when he was in Akka, 